Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and uh, we're going to move on now and talk about the exit markets, um, IPOs, M&As, um, and uh, um, what's happening in some of those. I don't, do we have a slide up? We do, but we're not in that order. So uh, instead, we've got Laurie next to me. I don't do introductions, by the way. Everyone's got them in front of them, and it saves a lot of time. So we have Laurie, Bill Hambrecht. I'm going to call you Lisa, Lisa Bayer and Marty from uh, Wilson Sonsini at the end. Um, so um, let's get straight into it, and let's talk about it, um, IPOs. There's been some discussion during the day about you know, the state of the IPO market or um, lack of it um, in recent years. It seems that this, you know, this year was the year that the IPO was meant to come back, and it's indeed been more active than it has been for a while, and yet not as active as a lot of people thought. So. What's what's going on? Has has something fundamentally you know, something fundamental gone wrong with the IPO market, or has Wall Street just woken up and come to its senses? Right, let's start start with Bill. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, people started to think that uh, there was a big backlog of companies building up. That there were a lot of uh, companies that had been in venture portfolios for 10, 12, 15 years even that had achieved you know, good, solid businesses, and that they would be looking for access to the IPO market. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened at all, really. Uh, what's happened, I think, is the market does uh, have a great deal of enthusiasm for any company that has scaled up very rapidly on the internet. And of course, with Google out there as the example, people are looking for the next Google. So if you have a uh, very rapidly growing, scaled up company on the internet, sure. But I, I would guess there's maybe 20 of those. And I would also guess that there may be as many as 1,000 of the other category, the kind of company that uh, probably has earning power that could support a market cap of 50 to 100 million, maybe 150 million. But the market just is not structured to deal with that kind of company now. There's been tremendous consolidation among the underwriters. And of course, the, the six major underwriters are basically will get interested at the $100 million level for a deal uh, and, and not much below that. The uh, old four horsemen kind of firms like my old firm and those like it are all gone. And there's a couple that are now trying to put together something, but there's really no underwriting community out there to service the uh, smaller deal. So it's, so it's the economics, it's not, it's not regulation. We hear so many people say, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley has killed yeah. the small IPO. It's not, it's not regulation. Then. Well, a, a little bit. I mean, the, the costs of going public through an S1 has moved up as, as it's been dominated more by the bigger firms. So, you know, the, for a company to file a registration statement and gamble that they're going to get a successful IPO normally means risking anywhere from a million to two million dollars. So that's a big decision and a tough decision for these smaller companies. So I think the regulatory side of it has to be simplified. We can talk about that later if yeah. you'd like. I can give other people some let's, chance at choice. Do that. I can see Lisa's jumping out of yeah. the chair. Yeah, right? yeah I'd, I'd like to let it go. I'd jump in. First of all, I have right? huge respect for Bill Hambrick and everything that he's done in the market. That's which is normally been... a bad sign when somebody starts like No, 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 but yeah. I'm going <laughs> to disagree a little bit about what's going on this year because I think there's a very simple answer to what's happened. IPOs are brand new companies. They are, by definition, more risky than what they call seasoned issues, anything that has been out there. If you're a professional money manager, you need to be convinced that the reward opportunity is enough larger to accommodate for the extra risk that you take when, you're, when you invest in an IPO. Through August, we had a very robust IPO market, and we also had a relatively normal, if there is such a thing, stock market. In August, when Europe started to unravel, things went wild. And the, the mathematical proof of that is an index called the VIX that measures volatility in the market. And historically, when the VIX is at the number of 30, which is just a random number to throw out there, it's much more difficult to do an IPO. 
since August, it's been way up there. People would rather buy, as we heard someone say earlier, if you're a professional money manager, you would rather buy Apple at nine times because at least you know what it is. There isn't enough extra profitability in IPOs right now to make up for the, the incremental risk that you have to take. The market is just way too volatile. I would argue it isn't so much a structural issue because, for instance, we saw Citigroup sign up to do a $40 million deal for Zillow. Ultimately, it turned out to be bigger than that, but there are plenty of banks lining up to do smaller deals, but if there aren't customers for them, it slows the market some. So, but this is a 10-year thing. Are you saying that the market has just been too volatile throughout that period? Actually, I'm saying if you look at the 20-year pattern of IPOs, mm -hmm. it looks like the big honking pig in the python. We had a a huge bubble in IPOs, which was great. Lots of people did well. Lots of people made a lot of money. But when you see, um, when you see all these reports saying oh, it's worse than it was in 1999 and 2000, yes, it is. It was a bubble. And have we looked to see what the performance of those companies that went public in 99 and 2000 was? It was dreadful. The problem was that for a while there, you know, I keep saying this, but you know, two guys, a slideshow, and a dog could go public. But just because you go public doesn't mean you can stay public. And so I think that if you look at the normalized pattern, we're frankly right on track. 20-year data. It's, it's the Morgan Stanley data. It's not mine. But if you literally look at the numbers. It's also a much more sophisticated, uh, complex market for, for growing companies than it was maybe 20 years ago. And that is to say there is a lot of private equity capital sitting on the sidelines looking to invest in growth companies. And whereas, uh, just to draw the stark contrast, historically, uh, Bill, as you know, it, it was kind of venture investing, scaling up to a point where it was then a, a, a public offering. Now there's venture investing, there are later rounds of financing, there's growth financing. There, you know, why does a company need to go public? It either needs capital or it wants liquidity. And to a large extent, both of those needs can be sated <laughs> Uh, outside of the public market realm. That's not to say exclusively, but, but there so are the, other alternatives. So the private markets have made inroads here. They've expanded their, their remit. I mean, the, so I mean, to, to, at the risk of oversimplifying, uh, the argument, the Valley's argument for a long time has been, you know, success is built on big public companies, whether it's a Google or very soon a Facebook. You know, these are the big job creators, the big wealth creators. Um, and without that pipeline of big public companies for the future, then you, know, you simply won't see the same sort of returns and the same sort of economic achievement. Is it, Bill, you know, your thousand small companies, have any of them got the chance to be a Facebook, or as Lisa's suggesting, should they stay private and think of some other exit? Well, you know, I think uh, if you look at the overall numbers, you know, at, at, at the end of the bubble, in 2000, there were a little over 9,000 publicly reporting companies in the United States. Uh, today, there's 4,700. So what we've had is a dramatic shrinking of the small cap and mid cap market. And I would argue that it, Lisa's right about the IPO market if you think of it in IPO terms. But if, I think, if you think about it in small cap investing or mid cap investing, I think basically uh, that market has to be repopulated because there's plenty of money out there that will buy good small companies. It's over the last 40 or 50 years, it's always outperformed the large companies, not hugely, but there's been an outperformance and there's money available for those companies. I think the problem is that the company that can fill that role, that, that's making two, three, four million dollars a year, and therefore in a market that's anywhere from 12 to 20 times earnings, maybe it gets a market cap from 50 to 100 million. Uh, that ought to be available to the marketplace, and it really isn't right now. Well, what are the consequences of this um, in terms of how companies are built and what, what companies are thinking about and how they're planning for their own development and, and eventual exit? What, what about the sort of companies that, that you're dealing with? I mean, how are they, when they look ahead towards M&A or IPO, and they see this relatively scarce IPO market, how's it, how's it affecting their outlook and how they're behaving? 
You want me to start with that? Uh, yeah. you know, at Growth Point, we deal mainly with companies that are growing that are not uh, on the traditional IPO path. So they may be uh, having a terrific growth rate, but generally they're coming to us with their boards saying, we think given that in 90% of the cases, M&A is the exit rather than IPO, we'd like to start uh, increasing the value of the companies now to ensure that they have many options as they grow. And sometimes they'll have that IPO option, but uh, nine times out of 10, it's probably gonna be an M&A for liquidity. So they come to us and say, what are the kinds of things, what are the strategic partnerships we need to be building, and what are the kinds of things that will improve the growth of the company overall that we might not be thinking about that can help uh, build the valuation for whatever the eventual outcome is. Uh, and you know, if the IPO markets are vibrant at that point and would allow a company that doesn't have the hundreds of millions of revenues to go public, then that might be an option, but uh, more often than not, it's more often than not, it's not, so. No. But I think you're building the company in the same way. You're building it for growth. You're trying to recruit the best team. You're trying to close the best customer deals. You're trying to build the best strategic partnerships to allow you to find other distribution channels for products and services. So I think you're building the company in the same way. Yeah. Marty, I mean, you deal with a lot of these companies at an early stage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the investments that boards of directors decide to make in the company will vary greatly depending on whether or not they are building a company to last, that is to say, building a company to, to really stay as an independent company. Sure, someone might come and scoop them and buy them at some point in time in their future, but to, to vastly overgeneralize, companies fall into one of two categories. Either they're being built for scale and robustness and, and to, to capture a, a market position and built for the long term, or they're being built more or less for the eventual exit, i.e. The, the eventual sale. And to, to draw, and once again, it's a vast overgeneralization, but to, to, to uh, highlight a decision point, if a board is deciding to uh, raise additional funds, are they gonna hire a bunch of finance folks and lawyers and, and, and the infrastructure needed to scale an organization as a public company, or are they gonna hire more sales folks and, and uh, engineers and so forth to get product to market and, and goose revenues so that they're attractive to a potential mate. And once again, it's a vast overgeneralization as to the- But that's what, a conscious decision that you're seeing companies make at quite an early stage. They necessarily have to make that decision because if they're gonna build it for scale, both on the product and channel side as well as on the infrastructure side, it just is gonna require more money and foresight. And uh, given regulation and so forth, and given the market's expectation of the uh, robustness of the company at the time of IPO, it just requires more investment dollars. So when you're talking about companies goosing sales, I mean, goosing is a... I meant, I meant... Word, but I, I didn't mean it in any sort of nefarious way. I meant, are you going to... Are you going to... Are you going to prune this entity to be attractive to in any particular market, the Amazon, Google, Microsoft set, or the HP, EMC, Oracle, IBM set, whatever it happens to be. There are little these, these many markets of potential buyers out there. Uh, if you're in that market, uh, if you're a company who's likely to be bought by one of them, you know who they are and what they're looking for, and you're either just gonna go after customers or you're gonna build a big infrastructure to go and compete against them. And it's a very different set of investment opportunities that boards look at when they decide to do one or the other. Yeah, all right. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we called our firm Growth Point is a lot of times the discussion is the company has come in uh, often with their board saying, okay, we're at that growth point where we have grown revenues to a certain point and profitability and customer relationships. And we're at that point where we have to make a decision now. Do we go out and raise a big shot of funding to hire primarily sales and marketing to scale, often internationally scale, or are we at the right point in the market where there are a number of buyers that are interested in our technology where we would get a terrific outcome at a, at a terrific premium over our valuation that our investors paid? And so there is that point in time where you're at that growth point and you have a number of options. And, and often boards walk into our office with their companies and say, okay, do I take another shot of funding and try to grow this for the long term, or is now the point where 
those extra years are not really going to buy me a difference in valuation if I'm logically probably not going to go public. Yeah. So I would agree with that. Well, I, I want to get into some of the sort of questions you raised, Bill, about you know, the regulation and about you know, whether anything could or should be done here. But before that, um, you know, th there, there are places where IPOs are still strong, um, China, India, you know, some of these markets where much smaller companies are going public. Um, you, know, you only look at, have to look at a firm like Sequoia and to see that most of their IPO exits are not the US anymore. Very few of them are. Um, we don't know yet how many of those will be the big technology companies of the future. But what, what lessons should we draw from this? Why are those IPO markets active? And is it something that the US should be uh, scared about, fearful about? Well, you know, I think uh, 20 years ago, we were really about the only real equity market in the world. And today, you know, the China, I, I believe the China number now, they have about seven or 8,000 companies that basically trade publicly. India's always been a large number. They're, I think they're at 10,000. So those two markets now have very vibrant small cap, mid cap, and large markets. Uh, it's probably an interesting philosophical question about what does that bring you. Uh, I, I have been arguing uh, in Washington lately that uh, public policy that favors a M&A exit basically reduces jobs because almost every acquisition, almost everyone, is based on the idea of lowering costs after putting the two companies together. There's duplication. Whereas the great job creation machine in Silicon Valley has been created by the independent companies, the companies that have stayed independent and have uh, grown into significant companies like Google and Apple and people like that. That's where it's really happened. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that it's, it's a tough decision to make very early in the game. Uh, the, the year I like to look at as kind of a seminal year in the IPO market was 1986. There were nine technology companies that went public then. And uh, three of them were um, Oracle, Microsoft, and Sun. So, I mean, there were three that really did extraordinarily well. But there was also Linear and, and Adobe and, you know, some others in there. I know Adobe, uh, we were just trying to make a living. <laughs> What's that point? This is going to be a multi-billion dollar company. The only reason they went public is Apple would have bought them if they didn't. So it was strictly, you know, uh, well, let's see what we can do with it. Let's stay independent. And let's see where this market goes. And I think that's what you lose if you give up too early. I, I, I think actually from an innovation point of view, a public policy point of view, every point of view I can think of, I think we're far better off allowing companies to have the option of getting liquidity, because most of the time they need liquidity, not cash. I mean, you know, Google went public, what was, what was it, a billion and a half or something? You know, they've got $45 billion of cash in the balance sheet now, five years later. They, they, they'll never need any cash. But they had to have liquidity to, to, you know, stimulate the options for the employees, to satisfy the venture capitalists. And if you don't do that, you have to sell out. Yeah. Lisa, any lessons from China? Or well, yeah, to that question, why do we see a lot of IPOs over there? It, it's sort of my answer from before, because those economies are growing. When you have an economy that is growing, you're going to have more IPOs. And when you have a riskier economy, you're going to have fewer. It's sort of, at some level, that simple. Yeah. Um, and over here, going public is absolutely not a right. And I think too often companies think they are entitled and, oh, it's hard now. It's nonsense. It's a privilege. It's not right for every company. Uh, because let's look on the other side of what happens after you go public. You're owned. You're owned in a bunch of mutual funds, among other things. Not every company should be owned by the teacher's retirement account. And, and now, thankfully, because we have secondary markets, there are alternatives. But one of the reasons to go public, as Bill said, it's to get liquidity, particularly if you took venture money up front. It is in some cases to raise cash, not always, but if you are a capital intensive business, you can. It's so that you can control your own destiny because nine times out of 10, you sell out to somebody else, you lose your vision. 
I presume that's a big part of the Facebooks and the Zingas and Google back in the day. Uh, and, and the fourth reason is to make a statement. Sometimes companies, particularly in the components industry, want to say, we're here, we're for real, now we're public, you've got to believe in us. But if, if those things aren't critical to you, or if you haven't jumped over enough hurdles to prove that your business is stable enough to endure what it takes to be a public company, find plan B. I'm going to have to ask you the Facebook question. You knew the Facebook question was coming, right? We're talking IPOs. So, uh, Bill, Lisa, you were both involved in the Google IPO, which was you know, a radical attempt to do something different. We're not going to argue about whether that was the right answer or the wrong answer for them, but it was different. Facebook seems to want to one-up Google on everything. You've got a, com a company here that potentially is already worth $100 billion. Round it up, why not? So, do they need the traditional IPO mechanism? Can't they just go out and sell stock in the streets? I mean, this is an easy deal to do, isn't it? How should they do it? Are you, and by the way, are you working with them on this? Uh, Lots of questions there. Let's start with Bill. Well, uh, I believe, obviously I have trouble commenting directly. Uh, but I would say from an uh, obviously uh, what we've learned with the auction process is that the larger the auction and the better known the company and the more uh, real it is to the investing public uh, in a consumer sense, the better the auction works. And, uh, you know, we um, could debate the Google auction forever, but, you know, basically what they did pioneer, they were the first ones to use it in any large scale. And what happened was that they were able to offer the, the uh, ability for their client base to bid and to buy stock. There was no you know, protected allocation system. So it was truly open to their customer base, which was very important to Google. And uh, the compromise was it was run by conventional investment banks that candidly really don't want to have anything to do with an auction. Mm -hmm. The conventional investment banks want to keep the power of pricing so they can discount it and they want to keep the power of allocation so they can keep their customers happy. And it's that simple, I think. Uh, where our position now is if you really want the full impact of an auction, uh, don't use a major firm. So your advice to Facebook <laughs> then is do an auction and don't use the banks. Yeah, uh, and listening? there's no reason why they can't. They, I mean, you mm. can do that very easily. I'm going to completely agree with Bill. I think an auction, I know, <laughs> I think an auction is when you have a stock that is likely to generate unbounded enthusiasm, as Facebook is likely to do, I think an auction is absolutely your best approach because if we look back to LinkedIn earlier this spring, uh, they ultimately priced that deal at 45 and I think its first trade was 75 and everyone screamed and yelled and said, oh, the banks underpriced it. Well. Yes, just given the math, but the reason is that traditional investment banks in a book building scenario have to rely on fundamentals for evaluation because if it doesn't work, they have to be able to justify themselves at all the lawsuits that will clearly land on them and say, look, other companies in similar industries were trading at similar multiples and that's how we got to the price. But investors have no such restrictions on what they, have, they can pay. They can pay whatever they want. And so with LinkedIn and with Groupon, if they hadn't tripped over their own feet quite so often, and potentially with Facebook, it's reasonable to assume you will have a huge number of retail investors who just want to throw money at it. Just get me 100 shares, don't care, which is a horrendous way to invest, but it's reality. And how do you, how do you balance the fact that banks have to be able to justify the price they set versus in an auction? where it's buyer beware, the, the investor will determine what the price is. And so I, if I'm Facebook, I think an auction is the best approach. So are they listening? Bill, are you talking to them and are they listening? I bet I can't come in. Mm, so you're talking to them. The question is, are they listening? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the person that can answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, real, the reality is, and, yeah, and, and I know Facebook is interesting to talk about, but most companies, those 1,000 companies, all but those 20 you mentioned earlier, don't have the luxury of, of having the market disregard fundamentals and, and so forth. So coming back to one of your earlier questions, M&A versus, uh, versus IPO, and you, you talked about either exit. Uh, just to put a fine point on this, an M&A 
uh, transaction is often an exit. There's a disintegration of the entity that is bought into the larger entity. People go, some people leave, some people get put in various divisions, whatever. Maybe it's operated as a separate division. But for the most part, it, for the investors, it is an exit. Uh, an IPO is a door. It's a door into a new reality, a reality that's highly regulated, a reality where you're dealing with public, uh, public markets and, and the, the oddities of that. Uh, 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 pension fund, man, you know, money managers and so forth. It's a door to a new reality, but it's not an exit. There's no quick exit for the initial investors. And, and there's a period of time during which they have tremendous responsibility to continue to grow that company and suffer and face significant market risk in terms of what the value of their investment is. Mm -hmm. So I don't, view, I don't view the both as exits. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, anybody who goes public, it's, it's really a start of a new phase. It, yeah. But it does offer a liquidity option to the shareholders who were, prior, were private investors prior to it. Fair enough. Yeah. So, so um, we go to you know, what happens to most companies, most exits, and they are exits, are through M&A. Yeah. Uh, there are companies in the Valley, obviously, that have very strong balance sheets right now. And there's a lot of cash out there. Um, but it seems sometimes as though there are, in some sectors of the market, f relatively few buyers. You know, there's a Cisco or an Oracle or a Google or, an, or you know, pick your, pick your particular market. Has, this, has the exit market got too narrow for a lot of these startups? So, uh, you know, how many of them actually can create a real, a real sales process when the time comes? Uh, it certainly is sector specific. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, you know, many of the sectors that we talked about this morning, certainly in consumer internet, mobile, digital media, consumer health, uh, cloud computing and virtualization, software as a service, we're seeing uh, very competitive processes. We're still seeing lots and lots of interested acquirers. Where you have seen the compression since 2007, certainly what we had, we had a strong market in 2007, and private equity financial buyers made up about 25% of the market. Uh, that really fell off in 2008, 2009. The overall M&A market, the multiples, and private equity as a percentage of those deals really fell fairly precipitously to about 10% of the overall market and deals. And you haven't seen uh, that recovery in the private equity and the financial buyers. But the strategics, I would say, started to recover in 2010, last year, and in 2011. And you saw a pretty uh, vibrant M&A market uh, for many, many technology companies with the buyers with strong cash on their balance sheet and returning to the market. So we didn't see uh, as many of the transformative multi-billion dollar deals, and we certainly didn't see those from the private equity firms like we had in the past in the 06, 07 timeframe. But uh, the strategic investors, the corporate investors, were definitely back in the market. And depending on the sector, the valuations could be quite robust. Mm. Marty, are there enough buyers out there? I, I, I do think it is sector specific. But for an attractive company in any number of sectors, whether it be consumer internet or, or uh, storage or uh, uh, software as a service, what, what have you, uh, we are finding there to be competitive processes. Oftentimes, they will end up in some sort of exclusivity arrangement, but it is buyers are out there buying. They're out there shopping, let's just say that. And there are generally at least two who are interested enough to get it going. Uh, so it's rare that there's only one interested buyer, at least up until a certain point. You know, I didn't want to embarrass Steve Jerson. What, what, when Steve said, what did he say, 96 exits in green tech last year? I was, I was really curious. I wonder how many were IPOs and how many were m and I'll bet you it weren't more than a half a dozen IPOs. Yeah, no, I'm not sure in green tech. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that's right. Uh, right, do, well, do we have any questions? Do we have a microphone? There's a question in the far corner down here. Uh, you would mind introducing yourself first before asking your question? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Fass Mosley, and uh, I head up the IP investment banking for Kansas Tech in the West Coast. 
And uh, I used to be the uh, former VP of Acquisitions for Intellectual Ventures and also head of patent sales for Hewlett Packard. And my question is really around IP and the value of IP and also a tool, a strategic tool, um, and an asset that's now liquid uh, from an M&A standpoint. What does the panel think about that, particularly in light of Motorola's acquisition by Google of over uh, $12 billion, and also Nortel's patents being acquired uh, for, uh, again, multi-billion dollar sum, and uh, Kodak, uh, which is actually capitalized uh, lower than the value, potentially, of their patents? Let's take that, Marty. So, I don't think it's the case that that Motorola and some of the other transactions you've mentioned uh, necessarily sets the going rate for any patent or any patent portfolio necessarily. Uh, with respect to patents, beauty is in the eye, and value is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, so, by way of example. Uh, we represented recently uh, a, a buyer of a business, and the business we were buying had any number, I don't know, 150 or some odd patents, uh, none of which could be monetized by the business that held them because it was such a crowded space, and if the target business were to assert any of their patents against anyone in their ecosystem, it would be likely that others in the ecosystem would would come against them and there would be nuclear war. So there was a general detente in the space. The seller, a private equity holder of that business, decided that in order to monetize those patents, it would extract the patents from the target business, put them into a non-practicing entity, a troll, and go and try to uh, uh, monetize the value of those patents outside of that business and sell the business with none of the patent portfolio. It all sounds great on paper, but at the end of the day, a buyer doesn't want to buy a business with no patent portfolio to protect itself. So I, I think what we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of companies, strategics and private equity firms, come in and talk to us about how to extract the value of a patent portfolio out of their business and slice and dice and disintegrate that portfolio and, 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 and create some licensing program or what have you. But at the end of the day, operating businesses uh, in today's market need a battery of patents, need a portfolio of patents to protect themselves against the onslaught that may come and to uh, potentially assert against others who might seek to, to uh, mess with them. And the idea that you could just somehow take a portfolio of patents out of a business and, and monetize that asset without significantly adversely affecting the, the business that originally held them is, is, I don't think we're gonna see a lot of that, not, not, notwithstanding the, the uh, Motorola situation. Um, so basically there's a tool essentially called a grant back license which allows you to have the patents and basically sell the patents but still retain the right defensively to protect yourself. However, you lose the right to assert the patents against anybody else. Right. So in other words, you cannot be aggressive anymore but you can still be protected by, by the same patents because you sell them and you retain the rights. So from that standpoint, as we know, I mean I've lived in the Valley for 17 years, as, as we know, many high tech companies have no intention of asserting their patents against anybody. They would like to be very much you know, defensive, and they like, they like that part of it. You know, and they don't like trolls, as we know, right? So, right. so that's just a comment back to your, your point. Right, and, and, you. and only because I'm sitting up here, I can have it. the last word on that is, <laughs> remember what patents are. <laughs> patents are a right to stop, they're not a right to do anything other than to stop others from doing something. So there's some misperception out there in the marketplace. So it's a right to stop others from doing something. So the defensive value of a patent is that to the extent you're a licensee of a patent, the, the holder of that patent can't come against you and say you can't practice whatever's covered by the patent. That's, that's the value of the license. The, the, the downside to only being the licensee of the patent as opposed to the holder of the patent is, as the gentleman said, you can't assert 
that right against any other third party. That is to say, you can't stop anyone else from doing something. The best defense today is a good offense. And uh, what our clients are generally finding is that to the extent that they have a uh, portfolio of patents that is robust, uh, just the fact that they are able to assert them against third parties stops those for third parties from asserting their portfolio against the, the holder. So once again, the best defense is the ability to assert a good offense. And it's for that reason, sorry to take up the time, Larry, but it's for that point. reason. Laurie, you want as, to jump as in? As we Go. look at the large acquirers that are um, looking at the value components in a company, especially in earlier stage, so if you're later stage and you're profitable and your revenue is growing like crazy, then much of the discussion is around the revenue and the opportunity to continue the growth and the profitability, and will this be throwing off cash? And some of the acquirers look for that. If you're earlier stage, there is a likelihood that much of the value may be in the team, the technology, and in some of those early contracts or, or products that have been developed, that early revenue growth. So if the most of the value is in the team and the technology, then the question that often comes out is, well, is that innovative technology protected? Are there patents around that? And they become more important. I think in, in the Google Motorola case, Google was going after a new market where they didn't have a long history of R&D like an IBM who would have filed thousands of patents in an area before they went after it. I see Claudia over there. So uh, going after a new market without having the patents around it, I think that was a specific need that someone had, that there was a gap in the market that they needed to fill with intellectual property. I will say in the last five years, uh, a number of the very savvy strategic buyers have looked at companies and said, okay, let's dive into the team, let's dive into the financials, and then let's dive into how innovative that technology is and whether it's protected or not in patents or copyrights or other things. Bill, you have something to add to that? I was just going to add, I, I was on the board of Motorola and was until after the deal was announced, and I think that was a, a pretty unique example in that uh, the Android system was threatened by the patent position of Apple. And as you pointed out, uh, Google did not have a big patent portfolio. And so, uh, and of course Motorola did. So uh, it gave, in effect, uh, Google the ability to horse trade and, and wow. basically allow the people that were using Android, uh, like HTC and people like that that had no patents at all, allowed them really a defense. Uh, so it was really a very threatening position to Android. Bill, maybe, maybe you can answer a question that still comes up a lot I hear around people asking around the Valley, which is, is the patent argument that Google put forward for the Motorola acquisition actually a bit of a decoy? And really, there's a lot more in them wanting to get into hardware than we've all given them credit for. And sure, we can all follow the patent smoke screen, counsel, but... You answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I always get in trouble this way. Uh, well, you know, I personally think that, uh, uh, yeah, I think the near-term problem they had to solve was a, uh, a defense of Android. Be and, you know, that's very important to Google. It's part of their mobile strategy, it's, and it's been very successful. So they had to do it, I think, because of that. By the same token, I think they acquired a very attractive company with a really strong hardware and software position and, and a great brand. So I, I think they got both. They wanted both and they got both. Yeah. We, we ought to move on, but I can take one quick one if anybody's got any burning question. Let's take one there and we'll keep it. Uh, Victor Abraham for the second time bothering you. Uh, I teach finance at Cal State LA in Los Angeles. And my query is to the panel in regards to mentioning that, uh, Bill said, leveling the playing field for both the investors and the issuers. How come we haven't seen more companies go public like Google did on the internet, uh, like it's happening in Asia and China? And I would like to know why other companies are not doing that in the United States as much. Well, All right. What did you try? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Partially because Companies, when they're going public and their boards, this is clearly an opinion, I don't have data to support it, are nervous, and no one likes to rock the boat. 
And so if you are most companies, you're going to talk to traditional investment banks and do things the way they like things done. And most of the investment banks don't like the auction model. Uh, and you know, you just want to get that company public and you don't want to rock the boat. So it takes a high profile company with a big tail to swing around to do things differently. That would be my view. Because more of them, in my opinion, some of them should do it a different way, but it's... For once it's I feel, I'm, my sim, I'm starting to feel sorry for investment bankers. We don't have any on the platform here, but I'm sure they can stand up for themselves. Do, was there one more that we wanted to squeeze in quickly, or shall we move on? No? All right, we will wrap up there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next panel. Thank you.